Simenon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simenon. It's strange, isn't it, George, how little one troubles to find out about a town until one has to. What gave rise to that not very profound remark, Jules? <laughs> it wasn't meant to be profound. It's just a fact. Were you thinking of any town in particular? Well, I should think it's true of all towns, cities, villages. No, I was thinking of Cannes, as a matter of fact. A beautiful place. Mm. I know it very well. You've spent holidays there? Yes, of course. Many times. <laughs> Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simonon in Liberty Bar, translated by Geoffrey Sainsbury and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods. What comes to your mind when you think of Cannes? Let's see. Cactus, palm trees, the blue of the sea I remember in particular. It never seems quite so blue anywhere else. The Provencal Hotel, very plush. I remember the air humming with the heat, the glare of the sunlight. People moving about like shadows, shadows in white suits, white dresses, with tennis rackets in their hands. Mm, there you are, you see. What do you mean, there I am? Well, that's the can I'd always known. And then one day I went there on a case, a murder case. Tactful handling required, according to headquarters. Why? Well, fellow had been in the intelligence service during the war. William Brown was his name, Australian-born. Lot of money. No longer in the public eye, but still worth a headline or two on a slow news day. And that was to be avoided. You were there in the summer, of course. Yes. <laughs> One of the local police inspectors, a young fellow named Boutigue, met me at the station in a pearl grey suit with a carnation in his buttonhole. Oh, very colourful. Mm. He took me to the scene of the crime in a fiacre, if you please. There I was, trotting along the seafront in this horse drawn carriage, sitting alongside a police inspector in a Panama hat. <laughs> Not what one's used to at the Quai des Orfeuilles. But very restful, mm. very calm. Well, that's what I thought. It was only later I found Can had back streets, dingy little houses, seedy little bars. But at the beginning, it was just like the start of a holiday. The fellow was murdered, or rather the body was found, a mile or so along the coast here at one of the poorer villas on the Cap d'Antibes. I didn't think there were any poorer villas on the Cap d'Antibes. <laughs> there aren't many, sir. This one was probably beautiful at one time, but they let it go. They? Brown and his two women. He lived with two women? Yes, for the past ten years. One of the women was his mistress, Gina Martini. The other one's her mother. There was no servant. Sun's not in your eyes, is it, Chief Inspector? I can always pull the awning down a bit. No, no, it's very pleasant. Mm -hmm. Well, go on, tell me the fact. There's a garage in the garden where Brown used to keep his car. Shabby old thing. He used it chiefly for shopping in camp. Yes. For three days, however, the car was left standing night and day in front of the house. People noticed, but nobody bothered. It was nobody's business. And it wasn't till Monday evening... Uh, what's today? Thursday, isn't it? Uh, yes, sir. Right, go on. On Monday evening, a butcher was driving past in his van when he saw the car start. Uh, you can see his statement, sir. He was coming up behind it, and first of all, he thought Brown must be drunk as the car started kangarooing along. Then it went steadily for a moment or two. But at the first bend, it crashed into the rocks by the roadside. How far was that? Fifty or sixty yards, no more. Well, the butcher pulled up, but before he could walk across to it, two women got out of the car and started running towards the town. Were they carrying anything? Mm, three suitcases. It was getting dark. The butcher didn't quite know what to do. In the end, he simply drove past the women and reported what he'd seen to the first policeman he came across. Word was sent out, and a watch was kept. Before long, they were spotted making for the station. Had they still got their suitcases? They discarded one on the way. It was found yesterday, hidden in some bushes. What explanation did they give? First of all, they said they were hurrying off to see a sick relation at Lyon. But the chap who caught them was shrewd enough to ask them to open their luggage. 
And what should he find but a packet of bearer bonds and about 800 pounds in Bank of England notes. So he arrested her? Yes. Quite a crowd collected, so he escorted the two women first to the police station and then to the local prison where they were locked up for the night. Mm. The house was searched? First thing next morning. At first they found nothing. The two women pretended they didn't know what had become of Brown. Finally, a gardener pointed out a place in the garden where the earth had recently been dug up. And a couple of inches deep, they found Brown's body fully dressed. And what did the women say to that? <laughs> they changed their tune at once. What they said now was that three days before their flight, Brown had driven up to the house. They were surprised he didn't put the car away in the garage at once. Gina looked out of the window and saw him staggering up the garden path. Well, thinking he was drunk, she started shouting at him. Then he fell full length on the doorstep. Dead, of course. Mm, as dead as a doornail. Uh, when we examined the body, we found he'd been stabbed between the shoulder blades. And they kept him in the house for three days without saying a word about it? Exactly, sir. In the end, they buried him and took to their heels. Taking the money and the bearer bonds. And all the valuables they could carry. Mm. You can understand the car standing three days on the road. Gina could hardly drive at all. She'd had a few lessons, but <laughs> wasn't up to backing the car into the garage. Was there any blood in the car? Not a sign. But then they swear they washed it off. Well, is that all? Yes, sir. <laughs> Except that they're furiously indignant and demand to be released. Do they, indeed? Ah, there's the villa. Hmm. I think I'd like to take a look around on my own, if you'd let me have the keys. Oh, certainly, sir. Look, why don't you go and collect the two women and bring them over here? Then I can have a chat with them on their own home ground. Mm -hmm. Put them at their ease a bit more than my going over to the prison. May get more out of them that way. Right, you are, Chief Inspector. Um, I'll drop you off here and bring the ladies back as soon as I can. Now, come in, ladies. Why, if the police have at last read... Yes, of see... course, of course. I do come in and make yourselves at home. I just wanted us to have a little chat, the three of us. Have you found out Go. anything? Take care, Gina. Tell me, what did Brown usually do with himself in the evening? We seldom went out. As a rule, my daughter read while I Let's sat in Let's talk a... about him. He used to listen to the wireless. The fonder one is of real music, the more one hates Was his, his health good? Oh. If only he'd listened to me, he'd never have been bothered by his liver or his kidneys. Now, you told the police he drove up just after five, walked up the garden path, and then fell on the doorstep. Yes, just as if he were dead drunk. I shouted out to him from the window that he could come into the house when he was sober again. Did he often come home drunk? Oh, if only you knew the patience we've had to show during the ten years we... Did he often come home drunk? Whenever he went off on one of his bouts, that's what we used to call them. And these bouts were frequent? Generally, once a month. How long did they last? Oh, he'd be away three days, four days, sometimes even longer. And when he came back, he'd be filthy dirty and soaked with drink. But you didn't stop him going off again the next time? Well... Oh, uh, surely the two of you had some influence over him. We couldn't stop him going to get the money. The money? I see. And you couldn't go with him? This is all very painful, Chief Inspector, but I must explain the situation. You see, we weren't married. Of course, William always treated me as his wife, even to the point of having Mama to live with us. And I was known to the people here as Madame Brown. Otherwise, I should never have been accepted. Neither should I. So that was why you let him go off every month, to get his money. Where did it come from? <laughs> he never told us. I tried to follow him, but he always shook me off. All I can tell you is that he used to leave the car in a garage in Cannes. So he might have gone on by train to Paris or anywhere else for that matter. Perhaps. Or he might have stayed all the time in Cannes. Though we never heard of anybody seeing him there. And it was after one of these bouts that he was killed. Yes. This last time he was away a whole week. Did you find the money on him? Yes. The same as usual. 2,000 francs. If you ask me, I think his income was much bigger than that. 4,000 a month, or even five. Only he preferred to squander the rest of it by himself, leaving the merest pittance for us. Were there many rows? Oh, hardly ever. Though I must say William had a most aggravating habit of simply ignoring you when you spoke to him. And then somebody killed him. 
Could it have been as he came into the garden? But you say you found blood in the car. We've no reason not to tell the truth. And you didn't see anybody, so someone killed him elsewhere. Or rather, wounded him, and instead of going to a doctor or to the police, he came up here. You carried the body indoor? We couldn't very well leave it outside. Why did you keep it dark? I'm sure you had good reasons. Yes, monsieur, very good reasons indeed, and I'd like you to know them. Well, in any case, you'll find out all about Brown sooner or later. He was already married long ago in Australia. He was Australian himself, you know, and his wife's still living. Well, for reasons best known to herself, she would never divorce him. If she'd heard of her husband's death, she could have seized everything, as she was legally his wife. Exactly. She'd have had the law on her side if she wanted to take the house and all that was in it and just put us out onto the street. So you hesitated. For three days you were turning it over in your mind while the body was lying here. No, no, only for two days. Then we buried him. And then you thought things over for another 24 hours and finally gathered up what you could and... But where were you making for? Anywhere. Brussels, perhaps, or London... Had you ever driven the car before? No, but I once had a few lessons and I thought perhaps I might manage it. Well, did he have a coat of any sort with him? Yes, this old Macintosh. Hmm? But he wasn't wearing it. It was in the car. Mm. Ah, there's some change in the pocket here. You'd better have it. Thank you. Hmm. What are these? Well, I'm sure I don't know. Oh, slot machine counters. Ten of them. I wonder where he got those. Madame Martini, mm -hmm. do you have the address of that garage where Monsieur Brown used to leave his car? Well, he used to bring the car in one day and then fetch it again a few days later. Drunk? Yeah, that's how I knew him best. And you've no idea where he was? Oh, well, the car was here. No, not the slightest. What did you make of it? I never gave him a thought. Hmm. Do all the bars round here have slot machines? No, they're prohibited. Two months ago. Oh, the only place you'll still find them is in those little bars behind the repair yards. They don't bother there, and the police don't bother them. Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, try the Liberty Bar. The Liberty Bar? Yeah, and uh, give Fat Zsa a hug from me while you're at it. If you can get your arms round her, that is. Hello? Anybody there? We're through in the back room. What you waiting for? Oh, good afternoon, Sasha. You've taken long enough to get here. Sit down. Hmm. You don't mind if Sylvie and I go on with our lunch? No, not at all. I've never seen you before. Where are you from? Nice? Antibes? Oh, Paris. Police should is here. Oh, so it's true, is it? What? that William was some kind of important person. Hmm. Now, who are you, Sylvie? Oh, that's William's goddaughter. Goddaughter? Oh, not in a religious way. He wasn't at her baptism. In fact, I'm not sure there was one. Was there, Sylvie? Certainly there was. William took to her. She used to tell him all her troubles and he'd do his best to comfort her. Have you had your lunch? Mm, oh, yes, I... If not, you've only to say so. We don't stand on ceremony here. Mm. How long have you had this bar? Oh, I dare say it's 15 years now. Do you have many customers? I don't want many. The ones who do come here are more friends than customers. Like William. They know I'm alone and... I like a bit of company, and they drop in to split a bottle with me. Get a glass for the inspector, Sylvie. Oh, all right, jean, jean Don't take any notice. She adored him, so it's been a dreadful blow. She sleeps here? Sometimes. Sometimes not. What does she do? You mean you don't know? Well, I think so. But did William know? Everybody knows. How long have you known him? Seems like I've known him always. I remember him in the old days. Owned a yacht. He used to come down here all dressed up in a white cap with a pretty girl on each arm. When my husband died, I shut this place for a month. Then the next winter, 
I spent three months in hospital with peritonitis, and when I came out, I found someone had gone and opened another place bang opposite. Since then, it's been quiet and up here, but now I don't bother. When did you meet William again? Oh, he turned up one day, out of the blue. We got tight and sat up telling stories half the night. In the end, I put him to bed on the divan. He was too far gone to get home. Since then, he's been coming to see me from time to time. How long did he stay? Oh, three or four days, mostly. How did you get to know her, Sylvie? Oh, poor thing. She come in one night with a couple of fellas, commercial travellers, some sort. They were drunk. She tried to get them to go back to some hotel with her, but you could tell she didn't know how. In the end, they got blind drunk and left without her. She started crying, so I took her in with me. Now she stays when she wants to. Quite a habit. Was she and William... Never. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were there. It's all right. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Now, what time did William leave here last Friday? Directly after lunch. We finished about two, like today. Did he say where he was going? Never did. Uh, were you here? No, oh, I left about five minutes before. To go where? To work. Down to the harbour? There, or anywhere. Now, according to the two women up at the house, he didn't get there until after five. Did he go to other bars like this? Not as far as I know. Anyway, there aren't any other bars like this. What attraction do you think Brown found there? In Liberty Bar? Let me ask you a question. Never heard of a drink called gentian? Yes, the drunk's last resource. Mm. Isn't very alcoholic, but when you've spent a lifetime soaking up every drink imaginable, it's about the only thing you can still get a kick out of, right? Yeah. Liberty Bar was the same thing for Brown. No vice, or at least no malice. A place where nothing had to be explained... The last refuge of a man who sampled everything and lost everything. And as a reaction, of course, against those other two women. And against the respectability and the boredom, the straight-laced Australian sheep farmers. Oh, he embarrassed them. I realised that the moment his son turned up. Although, apparently, it was common knowledge around the Riviera that the son wasn't as straight-laced as he'd have liked everyone to believe. He had a mistress tucked away somewhere, didn't he? Mm. Like father, like son. Oh, but he was very discreet. Not like father. A widow installed in a little villa in Cap Ferrar. <laughs> Whenever he left his hotel to visit her, he went out and came back in again by the staff entrance. So as not to scandalise the hall porter? No, something like that. But this time his mind wasn't on his merry widow. All he could think of was getting his father buried as quickly as possible and getting back to his money-making. I saw him in the suite he'd taken in the Provençal Hotel. Take a seat, will you, Chief Inspector? Thank you. Are you handling this case? Yes. It's an absurd affair, isn't it? Oh, not so absurd as all that. I mean, annoying. It's always annoying to get a knife between your shoulder blades. Still more when you die of it. You know, perhaps, that my father led a rather wild life. He certainly had a mistress. That's not all. Far from it. I'm sorry to have to speak like this, but if you don't understand the situation, you may put your foot in it. My father came to Paris many years ago without my mother. He nearly ruined us. Eventually, my mother managed to take the business out of his hands. She suffered a lot. And it was she who put the business on its feet again? With my uncle, yes. Her brother, I suppose. Yes. My father seemed to have lost all sense of dignity. We don't need to go into details, I'm sure you understand. One question, Mr Brown. Where were you last Friday? Last Friday? What's on your mind? Nothing. I simply asked you where you were. Has that any bearing on the case? Perhaps it has, perhaps it hasn't. I was in Marseilles. One of our ships was arriving, the Glasgow. You didn't see your father? I didn't. One more question. Who paid your father his allowance, and how much was it? I did. 5,000 francs a month. Thank you. Good evening. Is that all? Yes, that's all, thank you. Well, I had this ready. I thought some police charity might like it. I expect I shall see you at the funeral. Good evening. 
Thank you for letting Sylvie and me know about the funeral, Inspector. I wouldn't have liked to have missed him. Come on, Jar Jar, let's be getting back. Where's his son gone to? Oh, he's over there, just getting into that taxi. He didn't hang about, did he? Neither did your friend. What friend? The man who was speaking to you before we went into the church. Oh, Joseph. He brought us here. He's a waiter at the casino, and he's Sylvie's gentleman. He's a friend. I see. Excuse me, will you? Madame Martini. Madame. Chief Inspector, who are those women over there? Hmm? No, well, I uh, don't know exactly. They oughtn't to have been allowed. Where do they spring from, creatures like that? And his son's here as well, isn't he? Oh, I suppose he'll be wanting to come to the house. Well, he may, but I don't know. Oh, we must be getting along. We've got a lot to do. Goodbye, Inspector. Goodbye, lady. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones. Was he really married? Where's Sylvie? She's gone on. A funny funeral. I don't know why, but I'd never have thought it would be like that. I couldn't have cried if I'd tried to. It's as if it wasn't a real funeral at all. Are you the proprietor of this hotel? Yes, sir. Oh, here, sit down. You look worn out. Yes, I am. Have you any idea how many small hotels there are in this town? Oh, I see. Please. Now, I don't envy you your job. Well, who are you looking for? Oh, this man, here. Between two o'clock and five o'clock last Friday. Ah, oh, sorry. Never seen him. Or this girl? Oh, yes, yes, that's Sylvie. She's upstairs. Alone? No, but uh, they haven't ordered drinks. They shouldn't be long. Do you want a drink? No, thanks. Who was the fellow with Sylvie? Oh, I don't know him. Came in that taxi parked outside. Sylvie got here a few minutes later. The taxi driver says he's been taking him around all day. Took him to a funeral this morning. Then he brought him here. Did he, my God? Hello, Sylvie. Inspector. Is your friend dressing? Please, um, someone's expecting me. Well, I'll... he'll have to wait. Well, what do you want with me? Is Harry Brown still upstairs? I don't understand. Now, give me that bag. No. Hmm. You usually carry that much money around? Please, please. Look, any more fuss and I'll put you in handcuffs. Oh, damn, is that the... Uh, yes, it is, I'm afraid, sir. The man that was upstairs. Well, how the hell did he get out? Well, there's a, a side door. Some people are rather shy. Now you tell me. Can I use your phone? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, is Joseph waiting for you somewhere? Joseph? Your friend. Yes. Oh, shall we say your protector? We'll go and pick him up and then put the two of you in souls for a while. Uh, hello, Maigre here. Send someone over to the Provencal Hotel and ask Mr. Harry Brown, politely but firmly, not to leave the hotel until I've seen him. If necessary, stop him going. Ah, Inspector. Excuse me a moment. Yes, yes. That's all, James. You can take the telephone into the next room. Yes, sir. Read this, Inspector. Hmm? That's what I paid Sylvie 20,000 francs for. Yeah, thank you. Huh? Your father's will. Yeah. Huh? I, I must first of all explain a few things to you. Before his marriage, my father owned a very large estate in Australia. When my mother married him, she brought with her an estate that wasn't much smaller. And with the union of the two properties, my father became the biggest sheep breeder in the country. Then later, there was a lawsuit here in France. And he came over to see it through. He came alone? Alone. And he never went back? No. Proceedings dragged on. For two years, he kept putting off his return. Who looked after things out there? Well, everything was going to pieces. Until at last, my mother took over the business. For a long time, my father lived on credit, and we paid his debts. And then you stopped paying? We never left him destitute. But the more we paid, the more he spent. So there was nothing for it but to cut him right down to 5,000 francs a month. Mm, apart from the allowance you made your father, did you have any contact with him? Not directly. Indirectly? Any communication was sent through the bank that paid the money. A bank in Cannes? Yeah. And did you communicate with him just before his death? The bank manager saw him on our behalf. The last time he drew money? Yes. Allow me to explain. The situation between my father and the family was never really cleared up. 
he was still fighting for what he claimed were his rights. So there's a lawsuit still on? Yeah. It's been going on these last ten years. Mm. And all the family was against him? All, without exception. And what were you offering him to fade away and leave you in peace? Ten thousand pounds. Mm. Would he have been better off with that than with his allowance? Decidedly. Particularly if he'd bought an annuity. <laughs> Why did he refuse? To annoy us. It had become an obsession with him. He was absolutely determined not to leave us in peace. He even told the bank manager that he'd taken steps to ensure our troubles continuing if he died. How? Oh. He'd made a will. You're holding it now. Mm. And who do you think were his heirs? Four women. Did you know the terms of the will? Until today, I knew nothing about it. Well, soon after I got back from the funeral, a man asked to see me. Was his name Joseph? He didn't say. He showed me a copy of the will and said I could buy the original for 20,000 francs if I went to a certain hotel. You mean to tell me that you've been conspiring to destroy a will? The will's not destroyed. It's in your possession. Do as you think fit. I shall be staying here until you give me permission to leave. Is are you looking for Jar Jar? Hmm? Oh, yes. Who are you? Inspector Magret. Ah, then I've got a message for you. She'll be back in a few minutes and asked if you'd mind waiting. I'm to let you in. There you are. Make yourself at home, she said. The switch is on the right. Thank you. Ah, uh, hello. Uh, the Provence Hotel? Uh, Chief Inspector Magret. Uh, has Monsieur Brown received any visitors? A fat woman, when? Has she left? Oh, no, it's all right. She's here. Good evening, Jaja. Oh, there you are. Sorry I was so long. Oh, dear. My legs. I've just seen that poor child Sylvie down at the police station. Mm. There's nothing bad about her, you know. It's always those that have to pay for the others. Did you get yourself a drink? Yes, thank you, I did. Give me one, there's a dear. Mm? Yeah. Bring it through into the bedroom and the bottle. I must go and change these shoes. Place is in an awful state, but don't take any notice. No, no, I won't. Ah, here's your drink. That's better. You know, it fairly turned me up to see Sylvie there. Did William sleep in here? It's the only room there is, apart from what you've seen through there. He slept well on the divan? Sometimes. Sometimes I did. And Sylvie? Whenever she was here, William would have the divan and she'd share the bed with me. And what did she say to you when you saw her at the police station? She gave me 20,000 francs for safekeeping. I asked her where it came from. She said she didn't know except that it was Joseph's doing. Has she been a long time with Joseph? They don't live together. She met him somewhere, not here. He said he could do her a good turn and put her in the way of business. And what was the business he sent you on this evening? To see William's son, Harry, at the Provençal. What were you to say to him? That he was to get Sylvie released. Otherwise... Well, otherwise what? Just otherwise. I realised then Joseph had been up to something. Well? Oh, give me time to sing. With all this trouble, my head's spinning. Give me another drink. No, in a minute. Oh, let me have something to drink. I'll tell you everything. All right. There you are, then. Now, you saw Harry Brown? Yes. He said, if I annoyed him again, he'd have me locked up, too. But I'm not stupid. I knew that once he'd heard about the will... No, oh, wait a minute. You knew about the will? It was last month William spoke about it. We were here, all four of us. Not you and he, Sylvie and Joseph? Yes. We'd been having a few more than usual. It was William's birthday and we got talking about all sorts of things. He even said something about Australia. Well, what did he say? 
that he was tickled to death to think of what they'd say out there. Then he pulled the will out of his pocket and started reading it aloud. He said he'd had it all drawn up by a lawyer. A month ago, you say? Did Joseph know about Harry Brown then? Oh, you never can tell with him. Being a waiter, he picks up all sorts of things. And you think he might have told Harry? Supposing he did. Supposing Joseph had been and told him everything. And supposing Harry had said that he'd like to have that will, but what use would it be to him while William was alive? What do you mean? Well, he could easily go and make another, couldn't he? But once he was dead... Hmm... What do you reckon William would have been doing between two o'clock and five that Friday afternoon? Sylvia had left just before him, hadn't she? Do you think they might have... Who? Well, Sylvia and William. But they might have done what? How should I know? Met somewhere, perhaps? After all, Sylvia's young and William... Oh, they might have met somewhere... Joseph would have been in hiding, and at the right moment he'd jump out and stab William in the back. What? Harry Brown suggests the crime. Sylvie decoys William to the spot. Joseph does the rest. And then Harry is told to bring the money to the hotel, and when Joseph gets arrested, he sends you off with a message for Harry to say he'll spill the beans if he's not set free. That's it. Yes, that's it. And me thinking... It's not true. It can't be. It's not true. No, Zuri. No, put that bottle down. Charge her. Oh, God, no. Uh, something to tie it up. Uh, yeah. uh, this will have to do. Uh, you stupid old woman. How did you have to do that? Uh, I sound too bad for the moment. Come on, come on. Uh, hello, uh, police here. Emergency. Send a doctor to Liberty Bar. A woman has cut her wrist. Liberty Bar. For the love of God, get a move on. How will she be, Doctor? Well, it's hard to say. She'll never know old days, that's for certain. Oh. Well, we can't do anything else. At least not until the morning. Then we can see about getting her moved into hospital. And if she'll go. Yes. Well, we'll see about that. Well, good night, Inspector. Good night, Doctor. Thank you. Mm. Don't leave me. I'm frightened. Where's he gone to? Where's that little man? I don't it's want It's all him. right, Joshua. Just be quiet. Who's that? Why is there no light in the bar? What's happened? Shh, now, don't make a noise. Oh. Oh, now, don't worry. I'm not leaving you. Come in. I've got Sylvie here. Shasha! Oh, my poor Shasha! Go away! But Shasha, I... It's her. It's her fault, that filthy little lord. I hate her. Do you hear hate her? Lie down, Shasha. I shan't let her get away with it. Look, do you want a drink? Now that it's all up with me, you don't care how much I drink, do you? It's all her fault. What do you mean, it's her fault? She's talked. I know she's talked. They wouldn't have let her out. Joseph didn't send me off to see Harry Brown. I went on my own. Yes. Jaja, it wasn't William who slept over there on the divan, was it? No. It wasn't. He slept here in my bed. He came to Liberty Bar for my sake and nobody else's. You might have guessed that long ago. I guess that you loved him. And he loved me. He was happy here. He told me so over and over again. I never suspected a thing. I've been a fool. Sylvie nowhere to go. I took her in out of the kindness of my heart. I never meant to hurt you. He wanted oh, me to know. Oh, yes. 
blame it on to him. Just look at her. She wanted to get him. And Joseph wanted her to. That pimp of hers didn't take him long to guess that William had money. If he hadn't thought of it before, there was the will. Joseph stole the will from this room. William had talked about it. Joseph knew a will was usually good for a bit of blackmail. Then he set Sylvie on to him. No, that's not how it happened. One day, I saw her giving William a nod as she went out after lunch. She'd only been gone a couple of minutes when William followed her. As soon as he'd left, I put my things on. Do you know where she waited for him? At the hotel? The bow, so sure, yes. I wanted to go in and knock on their door and beg Sylvie to give him back to me. There was a shop on the corner that sold kitchen knives, and while they were while they were up there, I went in. I bought a knife. Then they came out, those two. He bought her some chocolate. Then she went off and he went to the car. I knew the road he'd be going along, so I went and waited. As soon as he saw me, he stopped and opened the door. There was nobody about, and I shouted at him. I've got something for you, and it's for her, too. And you stabbed him? I can't remember what happened next. I suppose he pushed me out and slammed the door. There was no knife in my hand. I must have dropped it in the car. When I woke up next morning, I could hardly believe it. Oh, William. My poor William. It, it isn't true. I... Come out into the bar. I... It isn't true. I must make you understand. Mm. I love Jean Jean. I'd never have done it if he hadn't begged me and begged me. Well, he kept on begging me, and how could I refuse him when every night with other now men I... keep your voice down. Oh, let her hear. If she thinks it over, she'll understand. And when I did go with him, I, I didn't even want Joseph to know. I was afraid he'd take advantage of it. Was that the first time? The only time. It's quite true about the chocolates. He was mad, treated me as if I hadn't been a tart. And that's all? I'd no idea Zsa, Zsa killed him. I thought it might have been Joseph. I was afraid. And he told me to go to the boat as you where somebody was to bring me some money. But I didn't know who it was till he came into the room. Mm. What else could I do? Is Zsa, Zsa badly hurt? No. Now, I think she's sleeping. Now, stay with her. Mm. And when she wakes up, you'll tell her that I've gone. For good. You'll tell her that she's been dreaming, that she's had a nightmare. I, I don't understand. And, and Joseph? You love him? One has to have a man. And William? Oh, that was different. He wasn't one of us. Mm. Now lie low for a while. We'd better all forget about Liberty Bar. Thank you. I, um... Georgia. Uh, I tell you, she's the best woman in the world. I know. Now look after her, Sylvie, for as long as she needs it. There's the will, Mr. Brown. You mean I... It's yours. After all, you paid 20,000 francs for it. We're only too anxious to treat them generously. I, I was thinking of 100,000 francs to each of them. I hope you understand it. It's not the money we're concerned about, it's the scandal. Oh, I understand. In France... Yeah? Well, in France, scandal doesn't matter as much as in my country. No. No, there was one other thing. Yeah? I believe you have a friend, a lady whom you visit in Cap Ferrat. Does this have any bearing upon the case? Well, only indirectly, and of course the case is closed. But your father had what we in France would call... A love affair with those women. I'd be interested to know how you think your Australian acquaintances would refer to your friendship with the widow of Cap Ferrar. 
I shall report you to your superiors for that remark, Chief Inspector. No, Mr. Brown. After all, I did not make the remark as a policeman. It was unofficial. As I said before, the case is closed. That will you have there never existed. Your generous gifts to the four ladies will be greatly appreciated. And there'll be no scandal either here in France or in your country. Good morning, Mr. Brown. So your report was what? Murder by person or persons unknown? Hmm. And that let everyone carry on living as usual. Or dying as usual. Jean Jean only had a few more months to live. Depending on how much she drank. Exactly. This wasn't only a love story, it was a drink story. They must have made a good pair, William and Jaja. Zsa. Oh, yes. Both getting on a bit, both feeling a bit lost, then finding each other. Kindred spirits, mm. able to keep in step with each other, glass for glass. She must be dead, too, by now. I wonder if the hundred thousand francs arrived in time for her to enjoy any of it. Oh, I hope so. So do I. Anyway, it's over now. Whatever happened, it was a poor little love story with a rotten ending. In Liberty Bar by Georges Simonon, Translated by Geoffrey Sainsbury and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods, Maigret was played by Maurice Denham and Simonon by Michael Goff. Boutigue, Kenneth Shanley, Madame Martini, Shirley Dixon, Gina Martini, Diana Eden, Jaja, Margot van der Berg, Sylvie, Eva Haddon, Brown, Kevin Brennan, and other parts were played by Rod Beecham. The play was produced and directed by Christopher Venning. <laughs>